Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on document approval, control and distribution, how to meet FDA QSR and ISO 13485 requirements in a cost-effective manner. My name is Ramesh and I'm going to be your host today. On behalf of our team, I would like to thank you for being part of this event. Today's webinar will be presented by Jeff Kassoff. Jeff Kassoff is the Director of Regulatory Affairs at LifeTech Incorporated a leading manufacturer of Eurodynamic and anesthesia devices. In this capacity, Jeff oversees corporate compliance with all domestic and international regulations. Jeff has been involved in regulatory affairs since 1986. Over which time, he has introduced, implemented, and overseen document control systems that have undergone scrutiny by domestic and international agencies. Jeff received his REPS certification in 1996. We are honored to have such a distinguished person as Jeff with us to present this webinar. Now, before we begin, I would like to inform you of the program outlined for this training session. This webinar is for 60 minutes duration. First, Jeff will take you through today's webinar, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. We would like to inform you that all participants, once part of the teleconference, have been placed on mute and will remain so until the Q&A window begins towards the end of the webinar. It is for the purpose of avoiding discontinuity and for allowing the presenter to speak clearly so that everyone present can take maximum benefit from this webinar. We also request you to hold back your questions until the Q&A window begins or uh, during the presentation if you have any questions you could uh, send it to me through a chat panel and I shall pass it on to our presenter for an answer during the uh, Q&A session. Now, if for any reason you get logged out of this training session or teleconference, please follow the same procedure to join again. Now that we are all ready to start, I request Jeff to take it from you. Jeff? Thank you so much for the introduction, Ramesh. Let me welcome everybody to this webinar. And of course, by welcome, I mean that you're at your desk and I'm at mine. That's, in my opinion, the only real detriment of the whole webinar system. I can't see you, you can't see me, otherwise it's pretty much the same. To ameliorate that, what I like to do is have my Q&A session at the end, have our Q&A session at the end, be more of a give and take. If you have a question and I answer it, if I'm not clear or it's not the answer you were looking for, feel free to say, feel free to, <coughs> excuse me, follow it up with an additional question. Even if you have a specific question as far as your firm's uh, document control system or distribution mechanisms or things like that, I'm more than happy to talk about that. Before I begin, just a little about myself. I've been involved in the oversight of document control systems pretty much since I began in the medical device field. At the first company I worked at, which was a very, very small startup, five people, I developed sort of a run-of-the-mill, paper-heavy, paper-intensive document control system. It was really a small company, and there was one main product, product line, and the system met our needs. At my next company, I inherited one of those commercially available purchased document control systems that you see out there. It worked very well and met our needs there too. Unfortunately, what you see is that the downside with one of those purchased document control systems is that if it goes down, you're pretty much stuck at the moment. Certainly, you're gonna have a, ideally of course, a help desk person there at their IT center, maybe fix, you, fix online as necessary, but at the same time, you're down at that moment. And God forbid if that happens during an FDA inspection, that's a very bad situation. The truth is, really no software program operates problem-free all the time. But you do need your document control system to be, to be available, if not all the time, pretty much all the time. When I first arrived at the company I'm at now, we had one of the a standard paper-intensive document control system. It was compliant, but it was very time-intensive. If we wanted to rush, and I'm putting finger quotations up here, a change through, well, it was really difficult to accurately use the term rush in such a situation. Recently, though, we developed a uh, what I call a relatively paper-free document control system. The bottom line is this, though. Absent reliance on electronic signatures, which is going to be outside the purview of this webinar, you can never really have an entirely paper-free document control system. I believe that the system that I'll describe to you towards the end of this webinar is about as close as you can get. The outline of this webinar is, I'm going to start with the regulatory history. I feel like it's important to let you know 
how document control evolved and where it was and where it is now. We're going to start, that we're going to continue on then with what's required. What it is that you actually have to do from an FDA perspective and then an international European perspective. Then I'm going to cover a typical document control system in place. And many of you have a system like this. It's just the most standard system out there. And I'll go through sequentially what's done and how it's done and where some holes are or things that can be improved. And then I'm going to go over a what I call a streamlined document control process. It's what we use here. And you'll see it didn't cost us anything. We use Microsoft Outlook for the most part to automate, if you will, or streamline our process. And then I'll hopefully, in, your, in all your opinions at least, tie it together with a nice new, uh, a nice neat summary bow. In, in any study involving any sort of compliance issue, in, it's important to spend a moment reviewing its history. Document control is required by both the GMPs, sorry, I guess I'm dating myself there, or QSR and ISO 1345. Since this presentation is device specific, these are the only two standards or regs that I'm going to reference throughout, although document control, of course, is required by ISO 9001. Document control has always been a requirement in these standards. It was recognized very, very early that one of the most critical aspects of the manufacture of medical devices is repeatability. This was not just recognized by the drafters of the standards, but also by the companies themselves. All medical device companies that I know of that were in business prior to 1976, which for those of you who uh, weren't around then, uh, was when the FDA first promulgated their good manufacturing practice regulations in which document control was part. All of those had some kind of document control system in place. I mean, granted it was barbaric and likely would not have met the current requirements, but the developers of these pre-amendment devices knew that they had to make the devices the same way each time, and they had to keep track of the changes, both as part of good design principles, but also, more importantly, as part of state patient safety implications. Document control is cited regularly by both the FDA inspectors and notified body auditors as deficient. The reason for this is that there's so much that constitutes a document control system that the FDA notified body inspectors end up spending an inordinate amount of time looking at it. You know, unfortunately, the reality is that you can be as attentive as possible, but you can still have a document control issue fall through your hands. What I recommend is that you don't spend too much of your time reviewing every single aspect of your document control system. If you do, you will drive yourself crazy. Your goal is to make sure that your document control system is part of all aspects of your internal audit program. This way, whether you audit by ISO element or by FDA subsystem, you're going to include the related document control aspects of that area. It, if I can rely on sort of an overused phrase here, your goal is to forget your, to dot your I's as opposed, as opposed to forgetting to write them entirely. Document control is also routinely overlooked by upper management as an area for possible streamlining. When it comes to document control, and actually in all aspects of regulatory affairs, the main goal, of course, is compliance. At the same time, compliance is not ever going to be a cost. It's never going to be a, a revenue center of your company. It's going to be a cost center. It eats money. Compliance costs money. Your goal when you develop compliance systems, and you know, including document control, is to make it as painless and as quick as possible to cost, le to cost as little as possible. After considering the history of a particular compliance issue, in this case document control, you've got to look at the requirements. And what I've done here, and I do this in all my webinars and also in person uh, seminars, instead of just really regurgitating the entirety of the FDA and the ISO regulations, I'm going to focus on the most critical requirements. These are the key aspects of the regs that require the most attention. Section 82040A of the Quality System Regulation is document approval and distribution. Approval requires that the documents be reviewed and approved. And you've seen here I have the review and approve in boldface. 
the concept of review is modified in the reg as for adequacy. And what you're looking at here is, the question you're going to ask yourself is, do the contents of the document communicate and or contain what they're supposed to? That's it. There's really no rocket science here. Is there a chance that the person reviewing the document could be wrong? Maybe that in his or her opinion, the contents of the document were acceptable? Well, yes. And that's why what you need to do when you have for document review is you always have at least two people from different departments or, or disciplines or areas reviewing documents. And that way, if it's a assembly procedure, you have your person over manufacturing or over production review the documents, but you also have maybe someone from QA or somebody from a service because they're familiar with their instrumentation, things like that. You have someone else review the documents. The drafter's intent behind approval is somewhat clearer than review. Approval is required to be documented and in the form of a date and a signature or signatures. Again, in your procedures, you're going to define which departments, that's why the signature has a parenthesis to S after it, you're going to determine which areas, which departments are required to document the approval. Uh, just as an aside here, some, some people have told me that it's unnecessary to explain this in the webinars. Others have said thank you, so I'm going to include it. When you designate signature requirements in your procedures, you do not want to document person, people by name. You want to document, or even by title, you want to document by discipline, by department. Something to the effect of quality assurance at at least a supervisory level. That way, your QA supervisor, your QA manager, your QA director can all, are all acceptable uh, approvers on this document. Distribution requires that the documents be both available and current. Available means at, available at all necessary locations. The word necessary is important here. Because what it, what it says is that there's no need to place documents at locations at, their, at which they're not used. An example of this is if, you're, if you have a document which is a purchase specification, there's no need to put that in production. Some people, when they distribute, some companies, or people, some companies when they distribute documents, they distribute every document with their ECO or ECN process with, they, they distribute them all to everywhere. It's easier that way. Sure, we have seven departments. Every document, every department. Well, what happens here is that not only does this make more and unnecessary work for your document control people, placement of new documentation, removal of obsolete documents, and their destruction, this also increases the chance of error of one of these. So if I have to continue my example from before, if I have my purchase specification on my production floor, and for some reason, the production manager or document control neglects to replace Rev B with Rev C. That's that, that's that's a possibility for a finding by a regulatory agency or an internal audit or an OEM partner. But it's completely unnecessary to do that. When it comes to currentness, current means that only current versions of documents be in use. The most effective way of, of assuring this is by removing obsolete versions from their locations and disposing of them. I recommend, not only do I recommend, I wholeheartedly recommend that you avoid any situation where obsolete documents are stamped with an obsolete stamp and retained anywhere for any reason. This is not required by any reg. It's not required by any standard. So it's the horrible combination of unnecessary work that introduces the possibility for noncompliance. Having said that, though, in some situations, a company may not want to remove obsolete documents from their locations. The only example of this that I can think of is a company that sells instruments, instrumentation that they service. Their service department will certainly have occasion to receive an instrument for servicing that's of a previous design. They're going to need the documents that reflect that previous design. And the reg does provide an out here. In boldface, it says, or otherwise prevented from unintended use. In your document control system, you want to make sure that it permits a particular department's retention of obsolete documents. And you specify which department and the manner by which they assure prevention from unintended use. If you have the service department, 
they're not, they don't use any documents for any processes. They rely on them. They use them for reference, but they don't actually use them. They, when they receive an instrument back, they know based on the uh, serial number perhaps or the DHR, the document rev levels to which uh, documents or, and or rev levels to which that instrument was made. They go back, they use their obsolete documentation to, fit, to repair that instrument. 82040B of the QSR is document changes. And what you want to do here is just like in just like documents in 82040A document changes must be reviewed and approved, the definitions of the previous slide, the review and approval must be in the same function or organization. Let's call that department as as the previous version of the document. Each document should include the name of the department as part of its approval field to assure this. I cannot tell you how many companies I've either consulted with or been involved with auditing from an OEM perspective where they only have blanks in their word versions or word perfect versions of documents. You don't want that. You want to have in the documents that are printed out for hand signatures, you want to have the, uh, the, each of the signature blocks have a department's name. You want it to say manufacturing. You want it to say QA, engineering. You want it to be there so you know that you are in compliance with 82040B subsection 1. You can have any individual from this department, like I said earlier, as long as you account for this possibility in your procedure, supervisor or above. There's a trick here, though, in this section of the regulation. And if, we were in, if you were looking at me, I would ask, who can see this? But the, sec the phrase, unless designated otherwise, is, in my opinion, a trap. And what, this, the tr what companies who fall into this trap run the risk of is they're going to have to uh, provide an explanation or justification or rationale for why it's not the same function or organization. It's extra work, and it's unnecessary work. There's no reason to do this. There's no reason why the assembly procedure for a, sub for a uh, finished, finished catheter needs to have any departments other than the ones that it originally did. There's no reason that uh, you know, production and QA and engineering are, need to be uh, superseded, need to be removed, one of them needs to be removed and replaced by your service department or your purchasing department. Absolutely no reason for that. Communications to the appropriate personnel in a timely manner. Well, as, the pros, as for appropriate personnel, this can easily and straightforwardly, straightforwardly excuse me, be contained in your document control procedure. The question you need to answer is, which departments need to know and who are the heads of these departments? Another caveat here, same as before, do not specify the appropriate personnel by name. Do this by title. You don't want to have to change your procedures when employees leave your company. The only exception, just as an aside here, is in your uh, executive management liaison when it comes to management review of quality systems, just something completely different. That's, and that's, that's a situation where the FDA and your ISO notified body are going to want to see somebody by name, and if that person leaves your company, you will need to change that. Just an aside for those of you who are into any of that. When it comes to timely manner, wow, this is one of my favorite uses of what I call dangerous vagueness in the entire quality system regulation. I mean, you can almost see the shifty eyes and, and evil laughs of the drafters of this one. Of course, we don't want to hold you to what we consider to be timely. Well, you may not agree. It's up to you, medical device companies. Go ahead and define timeliness in your procedure. I'm here to tell you this can be very, very painful if not done correctly. If you define what you consider timely and you do not meet it, you will have to do non-compliance investigations because you did not meet one of your internal requirements. This may be cited by the FDA. This may be cited to get notified body, internal audit. The best way to verify timeliness of communication is by internal auditing. And you may want to explain this in your procedures. I have. If your auditors, internal, external, other, never find instances of product being assembled to obsolete procedures or inspections to obsolete drawings, for example, you can therefore conclude that your communication of changes is timely. 
Well, this is simple and straightforward for a change. Uh, each manufacturer has to, maintain, has to keep records of changes to documents. And in every change, you have to describe certain things. A description of the change, meaning what was changed, how was it changed. Some firms utilize the uh, uh, redlining of documents, either in Word itself or they print it out and hand copy it. Others have change blocks at the bottoms of their procedures where it says uh, rev level, description of change, and rev level A is introduction, rev level B may be set 5.2 modified to increase curing process, that, that's fine too. As long as you describe the change somewhere on that document or on the ECO or with the ECO or ECN, that's acceptable. Identification of the affected documents. There are going to be changes that impact more than one document and that it's your ECO or ECN where you not need to make sure to include all the, all the affected documents that were changed. Do not forget your tier one index document. And what that is, is it's a list of all of your quality system documents that you use. Each time you change one of those, your index is going to actually going to change also. Uh, the change records also have to include signatures of the approving individual or individuals. Hand signatures. Again, electronic signatures is outside the purview of this, and it is not acceptable to include JPEGs or GIFs or PDFs or what have you. These have to be hand signatures of uh, the, the people themselves. Approval date and effectivity date, little distinction here. There are going to be times where when, when I bring it, when a document is brought to, my, to me for me to sign, I am approving that change. Now, I may be the first signature on that document. After me, the document control clerk may need to go to R&D, and then they may need to go to purchasing. Then they may need to go to production. Then the ECO, Engineering Change Order, is processed that changes that and other documents. After that, the change is communicated to the appropriate personnel via training or reminder or what have you. That, la that last thing, when it's communicated and things start to change, that's the effectivity date. That does need to be identified in your document control system, and that's ordinarily identified as part of follow-up, ECO follow-up, it's called in many companies. When it comes to ISO 1345, here are the document control requirements. And what you'll see here is that A through E and G are real reflections, almost identical, of the FDA requirements. And the second bullet point does also. You know, review and approve documents, update them necessary, uh, ensure the changes and current revisions identified, relevant versions uh, available, legible identifiable, unintended use of obsolete documents, and changes reviewed by original approving areas or another. I want to talk about F for a moment. If your company is, is or is going to be certified to ISO 1345, for those of you just a brief explanation, if you want to sell your products in Europe, your, pro your company is going to have to be ISO certified to ISO 1345, not just Europe, but many of the satellite countries that are near Europe, but actually not officially part of the European community. You're going to need to make sure that documents of external origin are identified and their distribution controlled. Documents of external origin are any documents that your company uses in their manufacturing or test procedures as acceptance criteria, the set policy, or in any other manner. Good examples of this are uh, ISO 10993, which is the biocompatibility requirements, or ANSI Z1.4, which is the sampling procedures for inspection. IEC 60601 is the electrical equipment requirements for safety. Even ISO 1345 itself is considered a document of external origin, even the GMP regs. What you're responsible for doing here is making sure that you keep track of these documents. You need to know several things, what you use and whether you are using the current version of this. The easiest and most effective way to do this is to purchase the standards, standards in digital form, and this is an option for almost all of them, and then place them in a dedicated directory. Also make yourself a spreadsheet, which is title, description, 
current revision. And somebody at your company has to be charged with the responsibility of being aware from a, I guess, a regulatory perspective of upcoming changes and, more importantly, changes that have already occurred to document to standards, documents of external origin that your company uses. It is acceptable to use obsolete versions of documents of external origin. A good example of this is the standard for particulate counting. Back years and years ago, we went by class uh, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, et cetera, et cetera. Then it was moved to, then they added some classes. They kept the previous classes, but they added some sort of in between 10,000 and 100,000, in between 100,000 and a million. Many companies at the time kept using the previous, the obsolete version of that standard because they said, you know what? We're class, class 10,000 clean room. We're, st we're going to stay class 10,000 even though they've added a, was approximately class 50,000 clean room. So if you, do, if, you do, if you do do this, what you need to do is make a note somewhere in your policy manuals, maybe somewhere in the procedure or procedures that use these standards that you understand you're using the rev from uh, you know, 2001 as opposed to 2008 and include a rationale why that does not affect your reliance upon that standard. Before reviewing the you know, streamlined document control system that I know you're uh, anticipating, I, I want to spend a few minutes reviewing this document control system that's really most commonly in use. The first step is that the requester of the change redlines documents and completes a change request. What, what happens here is that uh, he or she grabs a copy or copies of the document or documents that they want to change, they mark them up, and they prepare a supporting document change request. Second step is that the requester then submits these redline documents and the change request to document control. What happens here is that this pile of papers is handed to document control personnel or put in their mailbox or however it's handled. I say pile of papers because for the most part, if there's one change that somebody's going to request, depending on the nature of the change, they may not request a change because they know that they have to redline a document and then submit a change request. They're going to wait till they have maybe two or three, and then they'll do all those at the same time. So there are more times you, than you think that document control, document control personnel receive a pile of papers, a change request with four to six changes as opposed to just one. Then document control supervisory personnel review the redline documents and the change request to assure, to assure completeness and accuracy of the change request. Each of the documents is reviewed here. If the request involves a lot of documents, maybe in the case of a significant design change, this can be really intimidating. There are all sorts of specifications, assembly procedures, etc. Fourth step is that the document, document control personnel incorporates the changes into the current documents. Each document, each drawing, each procedure, et cetera, is changed to incorporate the red lines. It's possible that depending on the nature of the change and or how legible the red lines are, that the usually non-technical document control person is going to have to approach the requester more than once to interpret the red lines before they can incorporate the changes into the document. The fifth step is document control personnel distributes the revised documents for review and approval. In a normal document control system, the standard document control system, any manner by which this is done involves some kind of waste. If document control tries to save time by making multiple copies of each document for each reviewer to review simultaneously, this is a waste of paper. Depending on how many reviewers, a copy for each person can involve a lot of paper, not to say how much time it's going to take the document control personnel to make these copies collate each document, bring to each reviewer's office, etc. On the other hand, if the document control personnel tries to save paper by calling a weekly meeting for review, or maybe they call the reviewers to the document control office, this is a waste of time because what happens here is that each reviewer has to take time away from their normal work routine leave their office, go review the documents, and there are going to be some situations where, well, I can't come at this time, I can come in several days. And there's all sorts of things. I mean, you get the picture here. 
The sixth step is the approval of the document package. This is usually done either sequentially, in other words, one person, you know, first R&D, then production, then QA, or it's done simultaneously in the meeting. Some companies may have their document control person bring the documents around to each person for approval, or they could call a meeting, a, a weekly meetings. I've even heard singular meetings, depending on how critical the ECO is, at which everyone approves the documentations. Documentation, excuse me. Seventh step is that distribution of new documents, new documents to the appropriate work areas. Since you need to show, one of the regulatory requirements is to, you need to show that this distribution has occurred. Most firms do this sequentially. In these situations, distribution is accompanied by a sheet that each area's representative signs to evidence that they received the new documents and perhaps uh, destroyed the obsolete documents. And the last step is that the work areas either destroy the obsolete versions or they return them to document control. In this case, the lead or supervisor or what have you of each area goes to their document location or locations because for large areas such as assembly, there may be multiple documentation. If there's an assembly instruction that, and your firm uh, to assemble a certain subassembly, and your firm is a larger firm, and you make many, many of these, there could be six or eight or even more different locations of each of these documents that the production manager has to go, uh, you know, pull themselves. They have to pull the obsolete version of each of each new document, replace it with the new version, and then either throw away the obsolete version or return it to document control, depending on your company's policy. I've seen both. Uh, many people who have been in document control, like I have, prefer the returning obsolete versions to document control because this way document control can check off that these versions have been have been de destroyed absolutely. This system, I'm going to say this one thing, a bit one thing. This typical document control system is usually in substantial compliance. There is nothing wrong with this from a compliance perspective but it takes a lot of time and involves a lot of cost. The streamlined document control process that I'm going to explain to you takes a shorter amount of time. What you'll notice right away is the reliance on software. However, unlike those costly document control programs that you see advertised, maybe in MDDI or other magazines or online, <clears throat> that there's no way upper management will let you buy, this streamlined process uses programs you already have. Microsoft Word, Outlook, and involves a use, a use or uses that you may or may not be familiar with, but it's really easy to figure out. I'm here to tell you that if I can figure out how to do this, you can figure out how to do this, no matter how familiar you are with computers or how handy you consider yourself. I can, if there are situations where you are able to purchase, it is, upper management does gives you does give you the leeway to purchase an external. Uh, document control system, I still recommend you try this first. It's less costly and you come out looking really good. The first step of this is the requester of the change redlines the documents and completes the change request. Sometimes this is still going to involve hard copies. Many companies, as, as late in the 21st century as it is already, there are many companies <laughs> that still have drawings that are on, uh, that are hand drawn or things like that. Drawings that are on the assembly floor and technical machined type drawings often are like this. And these documents still entail re writing on it with a red pen. However, if it's a procedure in Word that you want to change, what you can do is you can use the Tools, Track Changes, Highlight Changes menu. As a result of this, every change you now make to the document is going to be identified. Just a warning here. Do not forget to resave it as a different name to set it apart from the current version. Some companies address this by letting people have read-only access to where they keep the Word versions of their documents. Others do not. So it's incumbent upon you, if your company is one of those latter types, to go ahead and remember to resave this document as a different name to set it apart from the current version. The second step is the requester submits the redline documents and change requested document control. If you're using MS Word, 
you know, Microsoft Word, what you do here is you're just going to email the file to document control. If you redlined a hard copy, though, scan it and then email the scan to document control. When I did this webinar a couple of times ago, one of the questions was, well, isn't scanning something that's already printed out just extra work? Isn't it easier to just hand the redline document to document control? The goal of this streamlined document control system, I call it the relatively paper-free document control system, is to be as paper-free as possible, to make all documentation as easily accessible as possible. All right, here comes, I guess, a spoiler alert, so I've got to apologize. At the end of the streamlined document control process, no document is going to be hard copy. All your documentation will be digital, and you'll see how we get there. In the third step, document control supervisory personnel still reviews the redline documents and the change request. They're going to review this for the same characteristics as they did before. This is easily reviewed in digital format. Multiple windows can be opened to review multiple redline documents simultaneously maybe for review of consistency. There's no paper shuffling. There's no piles of paper or paper needed to be all over the place. In the, for, in the fourth step, obviously, as I just stated, yeah, the document control personnel incorporates the changes into current documents. Um, if a drawing has been redlined, the same process is going to be used as in the paper-filled document control system, updating the drawing or whatever software program it's drawn, perhaps. However, if it's a procedure, redlining is ex easily accepted by using the tools, track changes, accept or reject changes in Microsoft Word. Step five is where the relatively paper-free document control system starts to show its merit and its value. Right here, the document control personnel distributes revised documents for review and approval, and the way they distribute this is via email. They don't have to make copies or anything like that. As I stated earlier, this is a lose-lose in a normal document control system because it involves either a waste of paper if they try to save time or involves a waste of time if they try to save paper. In this streamlined document control process, all the documents that require review and approval are merely emailed to the reviewers in the form of email atta attachments. Remember in step two, I mentioned that all the redline documents should be scanned. Well, here's another reason why, because online review is much easier. This system enables review of documentation for people who are not at the office but have access to, you know, can control their computers via whatever mechanism you have, which is more common than anyone could have imagined five, three to five years ago. But this way, you can be review, your supervisory personnel can be reviewing documentation when they're not even at the office. In step, step six is the approval of the document control package, a document package. The mechanism by which document control personnel send documentation for review approval is done by new message options voting and tracking options, and use voting buttons. In this manner, once the documents have been reviewed, approval is as easy as clicking on the Approve button. If the reviewer wishes to not approve the change request, he or she can click on the Reject button, and what Outlook does is it enables you to annotate the reply and include the reason for rejection. In this situation, document control personnel get this, they make the change, and the process restarts, but only for the document or documents in question. Once this e-approval is complete, the documents are approved via hand signature. This process takes seconds because all the documents have already been seen. When your document control personnel goes to your office and says, remember you approved the documents in ECO 5941 a second ago, or, you know, not a second ago, but, you know, yesterday or two days ago, here they are, and can you just go ahead and hand sign them? I used the word approval a moment ago, and I do want to say something about this. This is not approval in any manner. When you click approve in this function, you're not approving any documents from a strict regulatory perspective. Approval must be via hand signature or electronic signature in 21 CFR Part 11. So just again, remember that while you're electronically approving, we call it e-approving here, at our place. You're not actually approving any document. In step seven, this is where the distribution of the documents gets uh, given to the appropriate work areas. And what happens here is that document control scans the originals 
and they put them in the appropriate directory. Document distribution in this document control process is far easier and takes far less time. Document control, the original hand-signed documents are scanned by document control. They're put in the appropriate directory, and a notification email is sent to the individuals who are responsible for all necessary locations. This way you make sure that the documents are available, you know, are available at all points of use. That phrase is taken from the regs themselves. And remember before when, well, gee, you know, back in this normal document control process, well, when it comes to distribution, well, do I, I don't know here, is it easier for me to just make seven copies because we have seven departments and the production manager will throw all the purchasing, spec purchasing specifications or, well, do I have to, well, I only want to make five copies of this document, but only three of these, but this document needs all seven. There's a lot of guesswork that goes on when it comes to the document control personnel to determine which departments are the appropriate work areas for documents. Some document control people, I don't want to sell any, any document control people short. Some of them who have been at a company for a while, they sort of have a handle that this type of document goes to these areas. But there may be a new type of document for that that the person isn't familiar with. Or the document control person just may not have been there long enough to know this. When you have scanned documents that are put in a directory and notifications sent out, everybody knows where the documents are. You know what, guy on the production floor, production supervisor, you want to go take a look at the purchasing specification for this raw material? Go ahead, take a look at it. In this situation also, there's little or no need for destruction or return of obsolete versions. Since document control personnel have placed the updated documents in the appropriate directories, the supervisors and leads of this, the affected areas no longer have to do this task, which, while not incredibly time-consuming, certainly can be time-consuming depending on how large a company is, and it's still a responsibility that needs to be done frequently and regularly. What you've done here, most importantly, is you have completely eliminated a potential non-compliance when, when it comes to destruction or return of obsolete versions. Again, you've also precluded your need to wrestle with, well, do I want to have production throw away the obsolete versions? Do I want to have them, do I have, want to return, have them returned to document control? And whichever option I choose, I have to have a record of their destruction or their return and eventual destruction by document control. So to summarize here, the QSR and the RSA regulations do allow this use of, we'll call it electronic means of document control. Electronic change via redlining of documents using Word. Electronic review that you can certainly distribute the documents for review electronically. Hey Jeff, take a look at this. I have a change. Can you, can you uh, review this and get back to me? Electronic e-approval. Again, you'll see here in the presentation, I put the word approval in quotes. and. As I mentioned earlier, the reason I've done that is because this is not approved. This, sec this uh, sequence is not approval. The only approval of a document, this is probably my third time saying it, but it needs to be said, is a hand signature on a document, again, or electronic signature, and electronic distribution. This is the, the, the game changer of everything when it comes to electron electronic distribution. There are certainly going to be situations, just as an aside here, where Small to medium-sized companies don't have monitors at every single workstation. And that's going to happen. That's okay. What can happen is if, there, if you have a clean room that has three workstations but 12 individuals, <clears throat> it's okay to print it and you need a refresher or something. It's okay to print out a version of something and use it. The document you're printing out is does have a is a scanned version of an approved document, so it's okay to use at that moment. And you've assured currentness by have, making sure that your people are trained to take it from the appropriate directory. And what you want to make sure your people do if they need to do this is once they're finished using that document on that day, they need to just, they need to throw it out. So it's sort of the, it's they're relying on it as a refresher. They're actually assembling to it, and when they're done, they throw it out. 
the benefits of this streamlined system is it saves time and paper. It's much more convenient. There's less likelihood for misplacement of documentation. Everything is online. It's right there. And most importantly is that there's less cost. One, one last thing, something I want to tell you. I completely understand if you're uncomfortable jumping right in here, discarding all of your hard copies, and jumping just right in to this uh, situation. You know what? I was too. So I'm going to tell you what I did. We started the system, but we kept every single one of our original documents secreted off in a cabinet. It was more accurately a pile, actually. Um, when we had our first ISO audit, we showed the order of this streamlined document control system online. We did not mention our hard copies at all. And they didn't ask where their hard copies were. The next year, we did the same thing for our FDA inspection. Now, I have to tell you anecdotally, it's going to be the FDA reviewer who raises an eyebrow. Or you may think, more accurately, you may think may raise an eyebrow at this. But I can tell you that here in the Houston branch, you know, we have a very challenging FDA inspector. She gets to the bottom of things. You can't run it. You can't trick her. You can't run anything by her. And she has seen the system, and she did not ask where our original copies were. She certainly asked for our backup procedure and reviewed our document control procedure to make sure it stated which directory each document's go to each of the documents ty types of document goes to production procedures inspection procedures uh, quality system procedures and then she looked at the training records for each of our personnel every single person because everybody at your company uses some type of procedure and she wanted to make sure that these people have been trained to look to know which directory to look for their documents and also to know that if they print out documents they're to discard them immediately upon the end of use. So this is a so that's that if if you again if you decide you don't want to go ahead and jump into it there is a way that you can stick your toes in see how the water is and then go ahead and make your move if you decide to. Well, that's the end of the presentation. So what we'll do now is I'll turn it back to the facilitator, and we will take questions. Thank you, Jeff, for that wonderful presentation, and also all the participants for cooperating with us. As uh, Jeff mentioned, it's time for the Q&A to begin. And um, I'll be opening up all the lines so that uh, you could go ahead and ask your questions verbally to our presenter. Or uh, if you have any problem asking your questions verbally to our presenter, I, uh, I request you to send in your questions through the chat panel or the Q&A panel, and I shall pass it on to our presenter for an answer. Meanwhile, uh, we sincerely request you to share your thoughts. Uh, we do have a small feedback form. It's just eight questions, mostly uh, multiple choice in nature, and it wouldn't take more than two minutes of your time to answer. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, all the lines are open. You could go ahead and ask your questions verbally to a presenter. And uh, also, uh, Jeff, I had received a question uh, during the presentation from Patrick. Uh, it's in the chat panel. I'm just sharing it with you. OK. I'll look for it. I just sent it. OK. The question reads, oh, you, oh, you're getting it for me there. Thanks. <clears throat> Slide 15, if not approving electronically, what is the added value except to make sure that you will save time in collecting the signatures? That the, the value is saving time, is streamlining. The, the, the key to all this is sa remaining in compliance and saving time, therefore saving costs. So there's no added value other than to make sure that you save time in collecting the signatures. All right. Uh, thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. Um, ladies and gentlemen, all the lines are open. You could go ahead and ask your questions verbally to our presenter. Or uh, you could go ahead and send in your questions to a chat panel or the Q&A panel. And uh, I'll share it with our presenter for an answer. Or uh, if you would like our presenter to elaborate on a particular topic, you could go ahead and uh, ask our presenter to do so. All the lines are open. And also, uh, just wanted to remind you, uh, the feedback form is still open in the uh, polling panel. It's just eight questions, mostly multiple choice in nature, and it wouldn't take more than two minutes of your time. 
Uh, Jeff, I don't see any questions coming up. Uh, would you like to elaborate on any particular topic? No, uh, other than to say that if there are any questions that, that you all th uh, think of once you hang up, go ahead and get it out to a uh, compliance panel and they'll send it to me and I'll respond promptly. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're still taking questions. On a later date, uh, if you have any questions, I request you to send it to me. Uh, my email ID is ramesh at globalcompliancepanel.com or you could also send in your questions or through the generic email ID that is webinars at globalcompliancepanel.com. We are grateful to all of you for having taken part in this webinar. If any of you feel that your team members or colleagues or uh, friends might benefit from this webinar, we are happy to inform you that it will be available in the recorded format and can be purchased from our website or you could call us at on the number that you see on the slide right now. We welcome your suggestions and feedback or your ideas on how we can improve our webinars. If you would like to suggest a topic or desire a customized corporate training online or on-site, we ensure that whatever is your training necessity, it will be our priority. We look forward to having you with us again sometime soon and for your continued patronage on behalf of our presenter, Jeff Kassoff, and the Global Compliance Panel team. I would like to say thank you for participating in this webinar and we wish you a pleasant day ahead. Thank you.